Let's pray as we come to think about this passage. Father, we thank you that Jesus teaches us and teaches us with such powerful stories. May you, by your spirit you guide me to speak faithfully to Jesus' word. And may you open each of our hearts and our minds to respond in your, to your truth in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder what you are willing to forgive in, uh, that others do against you. Maybe if someone knocks over your cup of tea, are you willing to forgive that? After all, you shouldn't cry over spilt milk. If someone knocks off your wing mirror from your car, are you willing to forgive that, even if they can't pay you back for it? If someone spreads a malicious gossip about you, would you forgive them for that? Or if someone takes something from you that's really valuable and precious, maybe an item, um, maybe something that belongs to you, maybe even your husband or wife, would you forgive that? And if someone beat you, tortured you, pressured you, would you forgive them for that? These are tough questions, aren't they? How far should we be willing to forgive people? <coughs> I want to start off by sharing a bit of a story about Louis Zamperini. Um, a few years ago, we watched um, the film about him called Unbroken um, at the men's film and Chippy. And it's particularly memorable because at one point, a shark jumps out of the water. And um, those who were there remember that um, I jumped out of my seat, probably about a foot or so. It was quite um, spectacular. Uh, but Louis Zamperini was um, an Olympic runner um, for the United States before the Second World War. But during the Second World War, he ended up um, being in the Air Force and um, flying a bomber around the Pacific. And it's called Unbroken because the things and the events that happened to him seemed to completely fail to break Louis. His plane, his bomber plane, crashed into the sea. And although most of the crew were killed, he survived, along with one or two others. And despite surviving that, he then had to spend 47 um, days floating around in the Pacific Ocean, shark-infested waters, on a life raft with one other guy. Um, and yet he survived that. And, and then, although he survived that, he was then rescued, but rescued by the Japanese, and so put into a Japanese prisoner of war camp, where he was tortured and abused uh, mercilessly for month after month until finally the war ended in August 1945 and he was released. He survived that as well. Seemingly, Louis Zamperini was unbroken by these terrible events that happened to him. And yet the truth was, when he got home from the war, when he was released from captivity and reunited with his wife, Cynthia, he was actually broken. The experiences of the prisoner of war camp were so horrendous and so horrific. What had been done to him was so horrible that all he could think about was revenge. At night time, he'd, had, he'd wake up with nightmares of strangling his captors. And the pressure was so much that he was increasingly turning to drink. And his marriage was beginning to fall apart. The bitterness against those who had sinned horrifically against him was tearing him apart. He wasn't really unbroken. Inside, he was a very broken man indeed. Would you be willing to forgive those like the Japanese prisoners of war attendants, guards, who had inflicted so much punishment, so much damage. Well, Peter, um, in this passage, as ever, is the most outspoken disciple, and he comes to Jesus, and he asks this question. Um, and it's a question, really, is about this. How, how far should we go? How much should we forgive people? Peter realised that Jesus had taught that we should forgive others. After all, the Lord's Prayer... Um, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It is there at the heart of the Lord's Prayer. Peter would have learned that by this point. Maybe he'd been praying it regularly. 
He remembered at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had taught that um, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Again, an encouragement to, to forgive others. But, but the question was rising in Peter's mind, particularly after Jesus had been talking about those that sin against you and how to deal with that. Um, the right West question raises in Peter's mind, how much, how far can we go? How, how much should we forgive someone? And he remembers that Jesus said that our righteousness should be greater than the righteousness of the Pharisees. And apparently the, the, the Jewish teachers of the time, the Pharisees, said that you should forgive someone three times, a bit like three strikes and you're out. So Peter thinks, well, Jesus wants us to go further than the Pharisees. So he says to Jesus, how many times should we forgive someone? Is seven times enough? Should it be seven strikes and you're out? And Jesus responds, no, not seven times, but 77 times. And the point Jesus is making here is not that we should be keeping count all the way up to 77. No, we shouldn't be turning around to someone and said, that's the 76th time you've sinned against me. Next time I won't forgive you. No, of course not. Jesus is saying we should keep on forgiving. Again and again and again and again, forever. But to help explain why, because that seems to go against our natural instincts, Jesus gives, tells us this wonderful parable, this wonderful story. And so I want to think about that story now and how this parable works. Uh, like many parables in Matthew's Gospel, um, Jesus introduces it by saying, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's showing us something about how God deals with his people, how God deals with the world. Uh, and as we look at the parable, the key elements, uh, not every single element, but the key elements are there to represent things in the real world. This is a made-up story, but it speaks great truth about what happens in the world. Uh, and perhaps obviously to you, the king represents God. God is the one in charge, and the slaves in his king's um, building are, are, are really his followers, aren't they? But, but a key part of his story, the key issue in his story, is an issue of debt, financial debt. And in the story, Jesus is talking about debt as representing our sin or our guilt. And this makes sense a bit, doesn't it? Because when you think about if someone hurts you or upsets you, um, you might say to them, you'll pay for that. Or you need to make that up to me. We use those sort of phrases because we sense that when someone hurts us or upsets us, they owe us. They need to do something to make up for it. And maybe we expect them to do something to make up for it. And so the debt in this story, the financial debt in this story, represents our sin or guilt. And there's two debts, isn't there? The first debt in the first part of the story is the debt against debts owed to the king, and it represents our sin against God. And the second debt is the debt owed from the second servant to the first servant. And we need to ask ourselves, where do we fit in the story? Who, do we, who are we meant to identify with? And the radical answer is, in a way, we're meant to identify with the first servant. Not that we're meant to behave like the first servant, but the first servant is a warning to us how we might think we can behave as Christians, but we definitely must not. He's a warning example. And you see, the second servant stands for someone who sinned against me. Someone who's hurt me. Someone that I might feel owes me because of the pain they've caused. And the debt the second servant owes to the first servant isn't an insignificant debt. It says it's 100 denarii, denarii or 100 silver coins. That's one denario is about a day's work for a labourer um, in those days. And, and so in modern terms, you're talking about something like 5,000 pounds for 100 denarii, 100 days' work. Uh, and that's not insignificant, isn't it? Would, if someone owed you £5,000, would you say, oh, I'll let you off, don't worry about it? No, for a lot of us, that's a lot of money. We want it to be paid back. Uh, and so the second servant in this story is someone who's really hurt 
is an example of someone who's really hurt us, who's really caused us pain. Much more like the person torturing us or beating us up than the person knocking over our cup of tea. So that's the way the parable works. That's the setup. The king is God. Debt stands for sin or guilt, either against God or against us. The first servant is a warning example to us not to be like him, and the second servant is someone who maybe has sinned against us. So what is Jesus really trying to teach us through this parable? Well, we need to look at each debt in turn, because each part of the story is framed around those debts and teaches us very, very important truths. So let's look at the first debt. And the first debt is an absurd amount. It says um, that the, the first servant owes the king 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 was, was the biggest number that you could easily express um, in the language of the day. It was a massive number, and still is. And, and a talent, it was the, was the biggest um, size of money that you could get in those days. And a, a talent was so big, it was like, um, it, it would take a work, normal worker half their lifetime to be able to earn a talent's worth of money. And actually, 10,000 talents is completely an over-the-top amount because we're told by Josephus, who's a well-known historian from the first century AD, he, he looked back at the beginning of the, the century and, and said that, that all the taxes for the whole region of Judea and Galilee and Idumea, so the big areas, all the taxes they paid together came to just 600 talents. 10,000 talents is more like the whole, all the taxes paid throughout the Roman Empire, or possibly more than that. It's like, like the whole gro gross domestic product for the Roman Empire. This was an absurd amount. And Jesus says in the story, just to, to really make the point, this first servant owed that much money to the king. And now he'd been found out. And so he comes to the king, and he says to the king, have patience on me. How much patience did he expect the king to have? Have patience on me, I'll pay you back the debt. But if it took half a lifetime to earn a talent of silver, but it's going to take 5,000 lifetimes to earn all that money. How patient does he think the king is? And yet the king responds with outrageous grace. He looks at a man and it says he has compassion on him. In the Old Testament, it um, talks about God's qualities, and one of the qualities is that he's a God of compassion. If you read Psalm 103, which we're looking at in the services in church we'll read together. And I quoted a part of it at the beginning of the service. It talks about God's compassion. And in Matthew's gospel, the one who has compassion, well, of course, it's Jesus. He shows compassion over and over again to people. And compassion is seeing people's need and acting and responding because you're concerned about that need. And the king sees the desperate position of this first servant. He sees there's no way on earth that he's ever going to pay back that money. And out of compassion for him, he cancels the whole lot, the whole massive debt. And you see, Jesus is saying this is like us. This is like our sin against God. And you might say, well, I'm not sure I think that my sin is that much of a debt to God. I'm, I'm basically a good person. I, I, I'm, I'm generally nice to people. I, I hardly ever swear. Um, I pay my taxes. I'm faithful to my husband or wife. I try to be a good parent and do my work well. How can you say to me that I'm that much in debt to God? How can you say that I've sinned that much against God? We see the heart of sin is not so much the individual things we do wrong, but the heart of sin is the fundamental attitude that is true of every human being. 
You see, God created us to be made in the image of God. That is to, an image reflects something about the thing it's in the image of. We're made to reflect God's glory. And yet sin at heart is that attitude within all of us that says, I don't want to give God his proper place. I don't want to glorify God in my life. I don't want God to be the person enthroned over my life telling me what I should do. And so, as humanity as a whole, we've rejected God and turned and replaced his glory, replaced him with futile and worthless things. Running after money, running after popularity, running after status, running after human ideas or ideologies, thinking that um, life's about me being self-sufficient and achieving my own goals, or about um, hum humanity's achievements in themselves. When our focus and our glory is given to those things, when we worship those things, when we serve those ideas and those ideals, then we're dethroning God. We're, we're stealing his glory that he so rightly deserves in our lives and it's the greatest heist of all history because God is the creator of the universe he deserves total glory and praise and thanksgiving he deserves our loyalty he deserves our obedience and yet at heart we say to him no God I'm going to replace you with something else and Jesus says that attitudes at the heart of sin that leads to all the other bad things that we think about. The attitude that's true for every one of us as human beings puts us in debt to God to an amount that we can't even begin to imagine. Certainly it's something we can't pay God back for. We can't simply become more religious, start doing religious stuff, start trying to live a better life, start trying to make ourselves better or try a bit harder. That's not going to pay God back. No, like the servant in the story, it's impossible to pay the debt back. And yet Jesus says, if you're a Christian, if you choose to follow him, and put your trust in him, God is a God of compassion. And God will forgive us that debt. He will cancel it completely. But to cancel a massive debt is costly. If you let someone off £5,000 that they owe you, it will cost you £5,000. And Jesus says that this debt that we owe God is a massive debt. So how much did it cost God to pay off this debt? Well, it cost him the death of his son. Jesus says a bit later on in Matthew's Gospel, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom is a payment to set people free. And Jesus is saying that he, gave, he will give his life, he gave his life so that we can be free and free from that burden of debt to God, that burden of our guilt and our sin against God, the burden that we can never pay by ourselves, but God has paid the greatest cost. And to show how serious it was, he gave his son on the cross. The most valuable, the most precious, the most unique and wonderful person, thing in the whole universe. The one who as son of man was Jesus Christ, but as son of man was also son of God. The one who had been God from before the beginning of time, been with God from before the beginning of time. God gave him to pay the cost of our debt. And unless we grasp how much God was willing to pay, unless we grasp the seriousness of the cross that shows the seriousness of our own sin against God, and yet the love and the compassion that is shown against us, then we're not going to understand why it's so important to forgive others. God's love for us isn't just outrageous, great, amazing grace, it is outrageous grace. And so 
the first part of the story, the first servant represents to us what God has done for us through Jesus on the cross. We are the first servant in the first part of the story, but Jesus warns, don't be the first servant in the second part of the story. Because this servant goes out, having been forgiven, his massive debt goes out and he finds the second servant, the one who owes him this, this big debt of £5,000, uh, and he, sh- he, he shakes him. And, and what he does is not unexpected, really. If, if someone owed you that much money in those days, this would be a natural thing to do. Go and make him go to prison, go and make him go to jail to, until he's paid for his debt. Uh, and that may take months or years, but he'll pay you back for it. It was a normal sort of behavior to do. And yet in the context of what we just read, in the light of what God has just, or the king has just done for this first servant, what he does is outrageous ungrace. And the other servants see the fact that um, having been forgiven such a large amount, he fails to forgive someone else a relatively small amount, only one five hundred thousandth the value of what he was forgiven himself, uh, the other servants are, see it as horrendous, and they go and tell the king, and the king sees it as horrendous, and the king calls him back, and the king says to him, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And he sends him to jail. He says, you try to make him go to jail till he could pay you back. Well, I'm going to treat you the way you treated him. I'm going to send you to jail until you can pay it back. And yet, your debt is so massive. Your debt won't take a few years or months to pay back. Your debts will take 5,000 lifetimes to pay back. And Jesus says to us, this is a warning. Because God will treat you in the same way the king treats his first servant if you are not willing to forgive others from your hearts. You see, someone may really have hurt you. Someone may really have caused you pain. Pain that's hard for anyone else to imagine. Pain that cuts to the core. And in a way, that person owes you deeply. It's not that that pain, that sin doesn't matter. Just as the second servant owes the first servant a serious amount of money, Jesus is saying, yes, that pain does matter. That sin does matter. That was wrong. To forgive the person is not to deny that it was wrong. But as a Christian, do you see how much God has forgiven you? Do you see how much it cost God to forgive you that his son had to die on the cross? And if you see how much... God has paid to forgive, bring you forgiveness, then how can you not pay the cost of forgiving your brother or sister in Christ? No matter how much they may have hurt you, it will come nowhere near what God has forgiven you. Jesus warns us, don't be caught in ungrace. Know that God has shown you mercy, that you too can be forgiven. So how much should we forgive? Someone knocking over our cup of tea, of course. Someone stealing from something us from stealing from us something really precious. Yes, of course. Because we stole something even more precious from God. Someone has abused us or beaten us emotionally or physically. We well, yes, of course because humanity took Christ and abused him and beat him and crucified him. No matter how much we've been hurt, God has been hurt more. And yet God has forgiven us. And so not because the other person deserves it, not because what they've done to us doesn't matter, but because of that, we should forgive the other person. Louis Zamperini was broken, a broken man, because of the anger, the hatred he felt towards those Japanese prisoner of war guards who had abused him and beaten him for those months and years in the prisoner of war camp. And yet Cynthia, his wife, um, in the the late 40s, became a Christian. And she persuaded Louis to go with her to a Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles in 1950. And he went along 
and it reminded him of some of the prayers he had made when he was stuck in the boat, um, drifting for those 47 days. And he turned to Christ, and he discovered forgiveness for himself, and he discovered that God had paid the, paid the great price for his forgiveness by sending Jesus to die on the cross. And so Louis Zamperini became a Christian, and he experienced that incredible, that outrageous grace and he began to show the same grace to others. He forgave those who had beaten and abused him in the Japanese prisoner of war camp. And he actually traveled to Japan to, to tell them that he'd forgiven them. And some of them became Christians as a result. Louis Zamperini was captured by God's outrageous grace. He realized the price God had paid for him to be forgiven. And so horrific as the sins against him were, he was able to forgive those as well. Are you captured by God's outrageous grace? And if so, do you see how important it is to show that same grace to others, even the most unworthy? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to grasp um, that grace um, how outrageous, how amazing, how wonderful, how glorious it is. And help us as we grab hold of that for ourselves in faith to show it to others as well, that we may not be like that first servant in the parable. In your name we pray. Amen.